And happy Valentine's Day. We have all nine members, um, board members present. Ms. Koontz will be joining us um, in a little bit. Um, she's running a little bit late, so we'll call this meeting to order. And the moment of silence and Pledge of Allegiance will be by Ms. Hill tonight. I understand there's been another school shooting today, um, and I'd like this moment of silence to be dedicated to those families and, and victims that are right now in a lot of, a lot of hurt. Pledge. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Hill, for bringing that to our attention. Um, a couple of announcements tonight. The Knox County Schools Career Day will be held tomorrow, February 15th, from 4 to 7 at the Knoxville Expo Center, located at 5441 Clinton Highway. On behalf of the board, thank you to Pellissippi State Community College for being our presenting sponsor and to all of the participating educational institutions and business partners. We are looking forward to our spring 2018 Knox County Schools Recruitment Fair, which will be held at Central High School, located at 5321 Jacksboro Pike from 9 a.m. till 12 noon on Saturday, March the 3rd. I don't see any elected officials in the audience tonight. If you are, please wave your hand. Okay. Then we will move on to changes to the agenda. Mr. McMillan. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm requesting that the board of Ed add an item uh, to the agenda to consider approving a request from Gibbs Middle uh, to engage in an agreement with the Valor Academy in Nashville to implement the compass model of social and emotional success skills with their students. And I think each board member should have some information uh, uh, at their seat there. If there are questions, well, we can, we'll, we'll deal with that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Norman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to uh, add a short, just a brief discussion on cultural competency as regards what's taking place on Monday. Okay. Do I hear a motion that we approve the agenda with these two changes to it? A question, Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Hill. I just I just saw this, um, Mr. Uh, McMillan. Is is there any cost involved with this? Ms. Jackson, do you want to come address that? Well, we we can get into a discussion. All right, of thank it. you. Okay. That's we, correct. This is okay. just to add it, so Ms. Hill. So moved. I'll second those additions. Okay. So motion made by Ms. Hill, seconded by Ms. Fugit. All in favor of these changes to the agenda, say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. This token. Oh, yes, sorry. Okay, yes, thank you. We don't want to um, miss that. As you know, our Knox County School students recently participated in an attempt to break the world record for the most students learning to code at the same time. I'm happy to introduce Brandon Bruce from Cirrus Insights and Caleb Fristo of the Great Schools Partnership to share more detailed information as we recognize this amazing feat as the numbers have now been documented and verified. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks for having us. So we have the certificate here, as you might have seen in the paper, we had uh, 6,778 students uh, verified that participated. Really on the day of, we counted, we had over 8,000, approaching 9,000 students participate. Some were younger using iPads and they didn't count all those students. But we're thrilled to have broken the record. We've already gotten a lot of uh, regional and technology and even some national press coverage, which has been fun to see. So the idea really germinated over lunch. Uh, Caleb and I talked about how can we 
shine a spotlight on all the great work that the teachers, parents, administrators are doing in the schools with respect to teaching coding and STEAM classes. And so we came up with uh, this idea, which was, hey, if we can break a Guinness World Record, that's something that everybody rallies around. And of course, in Knoxville, we're very good at that. We broke the record for uh, game attendance in Bristol. We have the biggest letter T in the stadium, so we thought this would be pretty easy. Um, but really, credit to Caleb, who uh, took the lead in all the logistics, and Teresa Nixon uh, at Knox County Schools, and she wasn't able to come today, but she was really a leader in connecting with all the teachers and making sure everything went off with a hitch, because it's no, uh, uh, so that was a key for Guinness. They had to start the lesson and end the lesson at the exact same time. So we have about 12 students that joined us to shoot an instructional video so what, one thing that was neat about the project is uh, it wasn't just us telling the kids this is how you code. That's not really how coding works. It's a collaborative, uh, creative process. So my daughter, who's in second grade, and about a dozen other students, created the video that the other students watched. And then they simultaneously played along and, and learned how to code. So uh, for those of you that, that saw some of the coverage on Twitter or the news afterwards, you'll know that in Scratch, which is the program they use to learn, the first thing you do is try to figure out a way to get the cat to meow. And so once they got the cat to meow, we had a lot of really loud classrooms uh, across <laughs> Knox County. Because you put it in a loop, and the cat keeps meowing over and over again until you figure out how to end the loop. Um, so it was, a, it was a lot of fun. We're glad to have done it. Hopefully we'll have a chance to do it again in the future. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's a cause to celebrate that we had almost 7,000 kids go home uh, that day after breaking the record with a certificate that looks like this that said, I participate in breaking a world record. So there's a lot of local pride, uh, and hopefully we'll keep it here in Knoxville for a long time. Thank you all. Did you want to say anything? If you'll come on up here to the oh, platform, I think there's a picture opportunity. Okay. Okay, Ms. Coatney. Item seven, consent agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Norman, seconded by Mr. McMillan. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Item 8A, approve first reading of Knox County Board of Education Policy I-440, Wellness Policy, Nutritional Standards for Food Items Sold as Amended. Motion by Mr. Norman, seconded by Ms. Horn. Any discussion on this? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. 9A, approve grant contract with the Tennessee Department of Education for a 2018 Read to Be Ready <coughs> Summer Program grant in the amount of $139,400 designated for Green Magnet Academy, Lonsdale Elementary School, and Sarah Moore Green Magnet Academy. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Detheridge, seconded by Mr. Norman. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9B, approve application and receipt of funds from the Tennessee Department of Education for a 21st Century Community Learning Center grant in the amount of $108,000 designated to provide after school academic and enrichment support to students at Inskip Elementary School. Second. Motion by Ms. Owen, seconded by Mr. Norman. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9C, approve receipt of community grant from the Town of Farragut, Board of Mayor and Alderman in the amount of $22,000 for Farragut Intermediate School for fiscal year 2017-2018. Motion by Ms. Horn, seconded by Mr. Norman. Any discussion on this item? Okay, all in favor say aye. 
Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. 9D, approve application and receipt of funds from a Lowe's Toolbox for Education grant from the Lowe's Gives Back Foundation in the amount of $5,000 for Fulton High School, designated to create a makerspace within the school's media center. Second. Motion by Ms. Owen, seconded by Mr. Norman. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9E, approve application and receipt of funds from a Simon Youth Foundation Enhancement Grant in the amount of $3,632 for Dr. Paul L. Kelly Volunteer Academy. Second. Motion by Ms. Owen, seconded by Ms. Fugit. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9F, approve memorandum of understanding with the Great Schools Partnership for receipt of grant funds in the amount of $2,250, designated for installation of a water bottle refill station and supplies for the outdoor classroom at Westview Elementary School. Do I hear a motion? A motion by Ms. Roundtree, seconded by Mr. Norman. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9G, approve application and receipt of funds from a Knoxville chapter of the Tennessee Society of Professional Engineers grant in the amount of $1,000 for the l and STEM Academy, designated for the purchase of equipment to be used in the school's microbiology class. So moved. Motion by Ms. Dethridge, seconded by Mr. Norman. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9H, approve application and receipt of funds from a Target field trip grant in the amount of $700 for Sarah Moore Green Mining Academy, designated for student field trip to WVLT TV. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Fugit, seconded by Ms. Horn. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9I, approved donation from Knoxville Central High School Athletic Foundation in the approximate amount of $48,955, designated for phase two of construction of a new indoor baseball and softball hitting facility at Central High School. Second. Motion made by Ms. Owen, seconded by Mr. Norman. All in favor, any discussion on this? <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9J, approved donation from North Shore Elementary School PTA in the approximate amount of $40,311, designate, designated to a landscaping project at North Shore Elementary School. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Fugit, seconded by Ms. Horn. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 9K, approved donation from Rocky Hill Elementary School Foundation in the amount of $18,300, designated to purchase Imagine Language and Literacy Licenses for Rocky Hill Elementary School. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Fugit, seconded by Ms. Roundtree. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 10A, approved fiscal year 2017 Central Cafeteria Fund Balance designation in the amount of $1,000,000. $189,867.64. So motion by Ms. Nor Mr. Norman, seconded by Ms. Detheridge. Any discussion on this item? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Item 10B, approve request to replace the windows in the original Pond Gap Elementary School using Skilled Services LLC up to $460,000. Motion by Ms. Fugit, seconded by Ms. Horn. Any discussion on this item? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. TNC, approve revision to the 2017-2018 school calendar. Okay. Motion by Mr. Norman, seconded by Ms. Roundtree. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. 10D, approved proposal regarding Lonsdale Elementary School and Sam E. Hill Family Community Center. Second. Motion by Ms. Dethridge, seconded by Mr. Norman. Madam, Madam Chair, we have two public speakers signed up for this, this agenda item. Our first speaker is Tiffany Holmes. Hello. Hi. Tiffany Holmes, Knox County. Um, I'm proud to say that I'm a second grade teacher at Lonsdale Elementary School. 
Uh, this is my 13th year teaching, and within those 13 years, I've also taught at Chilhowee Intermediate School and Ball Camp Elementary. Gained a lot of knowledge through very different experiences at these schools, and so I feel obligated to stand here and advocate for Lonsdale. It is frustrating to speak in the shadow of two new middle schools, uh, but silence shows acceptance, and Lonsdale has been overlooked and passed by too many times to be accepting. Uh, we have a very unique and fragile ecosystem at Lonsdale. We receive a number of students in all grade levels that are new to the country and speak limited English or no English at all. So during the day, we are teaching our grade level curriculum as well as many kindergarten and first grade skills. We rely on our kindergarten and first grade teachers for advice, strategies, and materials to use with these students. We even have some second graders who attend phonics lessons with one of our kindergarten classes. Moving our K-1 teachers to Sammy Hill will be detrimental to our school. We are each other's greatest resource. Um, so just to put that in perspective, um, an example would be that I have 15 students in my classroom currently, and 10 of those students receive ESL services. I'm having a hard time understanding the progression of a decision that seems to be swift and not in the best interest of students. It seems to me that a decision would have had to have been made concerning the split much earlier in the school year, but our staff was not notified until the end of November. And then a couple of staff and community meetings were scheduled to mask an extremely rushed timeline, a single solution that was the only thing budgeted for, and a counterfeit concern for our school. If the concern had indeed been genuine, Lonsdale Elementary School would not be in the state that it is today. And although you are entitled to your own opinions about the deconstruction of our school, you are not entitled to your own facts. Lonsdale, Lonsdale was built in 1936 and was added onto in 1956. Our building is not up to code. The main purpose of building codes is to protect public health, safety, and general welfare as they relate to the occupancy of buildings. We have sick teachers. Some teachers who have taught at Lonsdale for several years have been severely sick. Others have had respiratory and allergy issues. We have cockroach lined hallways, flooding, mold, and mildew. And after Ms. Griselda, our interpreter, spoke at the work session about having to go up and down the stairs of our building with her crutch, she has been, for lack of a better term, confined to the first floor. Drive through Knox County and look at other schools that the Knox County school system has found a way to fund, like Hardin Valley Elementary. That is a beautiful building. It looks like a college campus. I can't believe that that school is in the same county as my school. That makes me absolutely sick to my stomach. Our robotics team went to the competition at Hardin Valley. One of our students asked if it had a movie theater bowling alley in it. I'm sorry. We're not asking for any more than others, um, any other school has within our district. We are asking for a stable, safe, and unified environment for the kids we teach and the families we, who entrust us with the most important things in their lives. Whether, our Knox, whether no, our Knox County students come from another country or have grown up down the road, their importance is the same. But unfortunately, we have learned through this process that there's a difference between what's best for our kids and what's best for our kids because our school does not have a large parent army behind us or a social media campaign or the money and resources to get what we need most. We seem to be no threat at all. A school full of immigrants, low-income families, and teachers who, as Ms. Thompson has put it, don't complain. But we will continue to fight for what our students deserve. If split, we will continue to fight for a solution that brings our stuff back together, a permanent solution that puts our students in a building that they can thrive in and be proud of. Nothing more and nothing less. A permanent split is not a solution for us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Griselda Sandodal. Good afternoon. My name is Griselda Sandoval. I am the full-time interpreter at Lancel Elementary and also the community liaison. And I am coming to represent the Hispanic community of Lansdale. Uh, they have wrote a letter, or write a letter, for me to read uh, to the board tonight. And we also, the community went around and they were able to collect 57 signatures of parents who also support this letter. Um, after attending two separate meetings in regards to the above proposal and attending the board meeting on 11-27-17, as parents of children and who are currently enrolled at Lansdale Elementary and Sammy Hill, we feel that the school system has failed the community 
has failed to communicate to families the problem of overcrowding at Lansdale. Ms. Julie Thompson has held two separate meetings with the community, one on December the 13th, 2017. On that day, the community would raise questions and concerns in regards to the move to kindergarten and first grade. More meetings were promised before making a final decision. On January 31st, a second meeting was held in the morning and approximately 18 parents were present. The date, time, and short notice of the meeting was not the most convenient for the majority of our families to attend. We feel that the community deserves another meeting in the afternoon before a final decision is made by the board. On, this, on February the 2nd, a small group of parents had the opportunity to visit Lansdale School. A tour was given by Ms. Henser in order to have a better understanding of the situation and to understand why the recommendation was being made. At this time, we realized that our children deserve better than being taught in the hallways and to switch from one classroom to another to receive ESL classes. Again, we feel the lack of communication among the school and the community failed our children. If the board makes the decisions today without any further meetings with the Lansdale community, we ask to consider the following suggestions made by the Hispanic community. Do not make this proposal a permanent solution. We want our children under the same roof, not two different schools. At Lansdale, at, our, sorry, at Lansdale Elementary School to the top of the list of priority schools to be added to the capital plan improvement. We want our building to be handicap accessible for students, staff, and community in general. Sammy Hill has only 17 classrooms available. We do not want to have the same conversations three years down the road because of lack of space at Sammy Hill. No outdoor buildings to accommodate the situations will be accepted. Consider building a new elementary middle school for the Lansdale community on the property where Rural High School stands, which is already a property of Knox County. Provide the same support, services, nurse, after school programming, interpreters currently offered at Lansdale Elementary. Below you will find a group of parents who back up this letter and who will continue to push for a better and bigger school for our children. We thank you for your time and for taking this letter under consideration. We look forward to continue to work together with the school board on closing the disparities for students at Lansdale Elementary. Thank you. That concludes public forum on this agenda item. And I just want to inform you, this letter was done in Spanish. I took the time to translate it for you guys. So I really wanted one of our parents to uh, read it to you in Spanish today. But most of them, they're on Ash Wednesday, so that's why they're not here today. Thank you. Okay. I saw Ms. Owen's slide and then Ms. Dethridge's. Ms. Owen. I just want to remind the board several months ago when this came, well, not really several, a couple of months ago when this came up, it was pointed out that a solution had been in the works for three years, but it was just brought to the community in November. That doesn't seem very transparent. That doesn't seem like we're, we're really working with the parents. <laughs> to have a community meeting on a Wednesday morning that kind of says the same thing to me. So um, I, I hope we will consider putting this off and letting parents have some input. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Um, and I appreciate the parents and the support from the council that came up, but I have attended the meeting several times and this particular situation came up years ago because we were landlocked and we needed parking space. Um, and as the, you know, the community has continued to grow, so now you got a uh, inside the building capacity problem. Um, I understand that this is not a good solution for everybody, but I'd rather have us to do this in an interim, in a temporary time span to get kids off of floors, to get kids in a place where they can at least have a, spot, a place to sit down and be taught by teachers. Um, 18 parents showed up at that particular meeting because the principal called it at 8 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. It had nothing to do with Knox County. That was, a, that was a principal's decision because she already had a meeting with parents that was already had been established. And so that was the reason why it was 8 o'clock. 
Uh, Julie Thompson and, and the principal and everybody has been out there several times to try to work out different solutions. And solutions are, yes, you need a new building, but we don't have the money, nor do we have the, a building before the kids can move into in any time soon. So you have to come up with something that's temporary, that's, that hopefully there will be a permanent solution later on. But right now the kids cannot be in the floor, in the building, in order to satisfy the needs of the kids at this point. It's not a, a solution that we would like at this point. And I believe that we have had several meetings. We have had several suggestions. The, the, even the superintendent, we have taken uh, uh, um, all the list of the things that have they wanted. I think the administration has been out there several times talking to Lonsdale and Sammy Hill. And so I know that it's not something that everybody's going to like, but we have to do something now. Uh, we do. We really have to do something now. And the conversation doesn't have to be with just the people in central office. I think the, the conversation could have been with the community and the principals in the building. And then some solutions could have come back to the central office. I'm just not, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm just stating the what's been going on. So it's not like we haven't tried. It's not like we haven't had conversation. It's not like we're not concerned. But something has to be done to get kids off the floor. Something has to be done to get kids in building and space. You've got empty space at Sammy Hill, one block and one and a half block over from Lonsdale. And it's, hopefully this will be something that we can do at this point in time in order to help facilitate a need. And so I appreciate the comments. I appreciate the, the passion because I also have passion for the kids. I also I know that we have a lot of my, di diverse and immigrants and minorities, and we're going to try to do whatever we can to help alleviate this situation. But right now we are just a landlocked issue, and we have to do something. And it's not going to be something that's going to be happy for everybody, but I just want to let everybody know on the board that we have been working and it's not like we haven't ignored this situation. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Danbridge. Ms. Fugit, did you, okay, Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't see Ms. Hansard here, I don't believe. Um, she couldn't be here tonight. Um, maybe Ms. Shannon Jackson could help answer this question. So in the information that had been presented um, in the presentation from uh, back in November, um, you know, and as Ms. Dethridge just mentioned, um, having numerous um, cluster groups of kids being taught ESL at the same time and then various interventions in this space issue. Um, I was just wondering, Ms. Jackson, if you could speak to um, if that is developmentally the best learning environment for a student as the teacher was saying um, has just arrived to this country. If you could just speak to that, because I know we've, as a background, I'm thinking about the program we've put in place at Central to try and um, address the needs of our bilingual learners. And so when I'm hearing large groups of kids on the hallway and things, I'm not sure that that's the best learning environment. So if you don't, if you have the information about their schedule and how that works, I'd like to just share that publicly on the record. Thank you. Ms. Jackson. Good evening, thank you. Um, so I, I will say that I've, I've been over um, one or two times to walk through the building and what I have seen are intervention groups and EL groups that are in the hallway or in shared classrooms. And the, the concern there is that students who are in intervention or in EL, that's language acquisition, it's a highly oral um, learning process as you well know and so um, it is best if those groups can be in places where the distractions around the room are minimized and the room itself can be used as the first level of scaffold to support the learning. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. I appreciate that. Ms. Fugit. Thank you. Um, just, just a comment um, following on what Ms. Dethridge and Ms. Um, Roundtree have said. I, I do think there is a an interim solution that has to be done. What I would suggest and encourage the passion that is here tonight. Um, I've been on this board seven and a half years. One meeting doesn't get you that. We need you to stay engaged and mobilize the community and keep bringing the situation forward and advocating for um, capital improvements. That, uh, that typically how it works. There's 
limited resources and we make a capital plan years out. Um, and and I, I hear your concerns and I am, um, that happens with some of our old buildings and but then we balance that with growth in other parts of the district where we have kids sitting on a floor there as well. So I just encourage you to keep the conversation going and the passion um, to help the community move this forward. Mr. Norman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks uh, to the speakers. Uh, you all did a very good job. And you're alerting several of us to things that we're not aware of. And, um, um, and this may be directed to the superintendent or to our facilities person, but a couple of those are pretty serious charges. Um, if we're talking about people getting sick and we've got mold and mildew and cockroaches and things like that, School, old schools are old schools and they can be very nice and they can be very clean and welcoming and good environments to learn in. We know that and we have some of those, but it's totally unacceptable to have mold, mildew, and cockroaches. That's just not, that, that shouldn't happen. So could somebody in our, you know, in our staff or somebody speak to that in facilities, let us see what's going on there. Are you? Right now, yeah. or okay, yeah. right now. Uh, Mr. Oaks. I can say that I've I've been to Lonsdale many times, and I don't agree with the characterization of the cleanliness of the building. Uh, there are challenges uh, with an old building like that, and we can have to continue to address those. Uh, first, I've heard about a concern of a mold problem, but we'll certainly go out and look at that and have our environmental people uh, do some testing and make sure there's not uh, an issue there. Uh, but we can certainly go back and look at that, yes. So you're not aware of any water issues then? We had some water in the basement this uh, over this past weekend, but we had water in probably seven or eight different schools uh, over this weekend where we had uh, the uh, extensive rain. So. That's something that uh, we can look at as well. Okay, so I just um, certainly suggest strongly that any any kind of concern like that in this transition period absolutely should be addressed, and we should do everything that we can to make this facility as um, as good as we can. Soren, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and I would concur, you know, we have other buildings that are probably nearly that old, Bluegrass and Sequoia and several others, and so um, so they certainly deserve the same attention as any other school we have. So I appreciate you checking in, into that. And I understand the difficulty in having elementary students in two different schools and the concern that that has for parents. Um, one positive is your the younger ones are kind of insulated from the um, from the state testing and they can be insulated from that if they're in a different building which is one positive but I worry more about if we don't make this decision to, to move the students right now we're going to continue with kids in the hallways so that's the problem so um, but I, I do appreciate you both coming to speak and um, giving us some insight into your school and your community thank you I see no other lights, so we will take a vote on that. So um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay. Did you get that, Ms. Coatney? Okay. Motion passes. Ms. Coatney. Item 10E, approve request of Simon Youth Foundation to relocate Dr. Paul L. Kelly Volunteer Academy to West Town Mall. So I hear a so moved, so moved. motion by Ms. Fugit, Second. seconded by Ms. Horn. Okay, any discussion on this item? Ms. Owen. Mr. Dupler, can you tell us what was found out about the, uh, the distance for selling alcohol? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Owen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as you might imagine, there's, uh, there's a fair amount of of, of differing information out there about uh, liquor laws and uh, beer permits and things of that nature. Uh, West Town Mall is in the city of Knoxville uh, and, 
and there's an ordinance with regard to uh, liquor sales, package stores, have to be uh, 500 feet or greater from property line to property line, um, from, a, from a school uh, specifically. And then there's a different ordinance that covers uh, beer permits. Uh, beer permits have to be at least 300 feet from a school. That's, that's a little bit more vague because it talks about building lines, so, so, so that might not necessarily mean property lines. Uh, and, and there's also exceptions. So, um, you know, this is not a hard and fast rule. This is, this is pretty much a, general, a generality at this point. And then, and then you throw in the, uh, there's a Tennessee uh, state uh, license that's for liquor by the drink. If, uh, if a business qualifies for that, then that business can also sell beer and, and could automatically get a beer license. So, and there's no restrictions on that. There's no, there's no distance requirements at all. So uh, what, what we're doing is uh, Russ Oaks uh, and I have talked about it and he is reaching out to the Simon Youth Foundation, Simon Properties. We're gonna try and find out exactly what the situation is out there and then, then we can report back once we know. Um, and then, and then, like I say, the, I mean, I mean, not only could there be a, a state licenses out there, which would negate this whole discussion, uh, but uh, but there also may be exceptions under the under the city ordinances as well. Thank you, Mr. Dupler. I just wanted to be sure that we have communicated with Simon Youth so that they are aware before before we approve something and say yes, go ahead, and then realize that there may be a law preventing it. Thank you. Ms. Fugit. Since I made the motion, I would like to amend the motion to say that we approve this subject to um, approval w w involving the liquor and beer licensing and discussion with um, the Simon Youth Foundation. I don't want us to wait and, and slow this down because um, well, let me just be quiet. That was, I just changed my motion. I need somebody to I'll agree. I'll that. Whoever seconded yes. it, I need That's to say, will you, okay, thank you. Um, now may I discuss? Okay. Uh, part, part of why I wanted to go ahead and move forward this discussion is, Simon is being very generous. They have given us space for an alternative, uh, for a, a different type of high school, which isn't gonna meet the traditional, a lot of the other traditional things that we deal with in high school. So if it came down to it, I, you know, I would ask the law director, is there a way to petition for an exception for a mall school? And so I just want us to go, to sort of go on record saying we're okay with Simon moving the school if we can get those legal issues worked out. Okay, so we have an amendment on the floor with Ms. Uh, Fugit making the motion, Ms. Roundtree seconding it, so we'll vote. Yeah, it was really a substitute motion, so oh, it's all good. A substitute, yeah, okay. I just substituted. I'm so sorry, Ms. Etheridge, did you oh, want thank to you. speak to that? I was just that? saying, I, um, I think we had a similar situation in, at the uh, Knoxville Center Mall because you had a restaurant downstairs that I think that served beer, and the school was upstairs, so they may already have something in writing. And I was just gonna bring that to the attention of the, of the attorney. So all in favor of the substitute motion made by Ms. Fugit, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Okay, Madam Chair, could I have a clarification before we move to the next item? Yes. And that is on the Lonsdale thing. Russ, will you give us a report? Will you give the board a report about the condition of the school? Uh, kind of a, a good going over in terms of the, and address these issues that have been brought up. Uh, yes, sir. I can tell you, though, if we're going to go back and, and uh, do some environmental testing, uh, that may take several weeks to go go through that process and get the results back. Okay. Well, I don't know how to do it or when to do it, but it needs to be done this year before sure. we move forward. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Okay. Ms. Coatney. Item 10F, approve 216-day teacher contract link for priority and cusp schools, including Austin East Magnet High School, Bell Morris Elementary School, Green Magnet Academy, Lonsdale Elementary School, Sarah Moore Green Magnet Academy, and Vine Middle Magnet School. Motion by Ms. Owen, seconded by Mr. Norman. Any discussion on this? 
Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know that we've previously discussed this, but there may be folks here tonight and watching at home that um, don't understand why we're approving this sort of separate from our future budget process since it goes into school year 18, um, fiscal year 18. So if the superintendent wouldn't mind just clarifying the rationale behind that, I would appreciate it. Okay. Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, be glad to, to uh, shed a little bit more light on that. But we've, uh, of course, priority schools and, and cusp schools, uh, we're working with the state right now on, on ways to, strategies to, make sure that uh, those schools don't fall in the uh, bottom 5%. We actually don't, do not want them in the bottom 10%. Um, in terms of the budgetary impact, um, the cost of this is about $1.3 million. What we had recommended uh, is that uh, with the vote that was taken on the Leadership Academy that uh, paring the, the money down considerably to take the funds uh, saved from uh, that agreement and in addition to funds, we, we don't know yet from the state, but there's, there should be some additional funds. Maybe we won't know until later in the year, but uh, uh, the title funds that we can use, but to come up with the total cost of $1.3 million. But this would fund approximately $900,000 of the cost. And, and actually, uh, to use this time for professional development for the staffs and uh, um, in terms of the teachers giving them a little bit more incentive in terms of some extra pay to uh, to do the work. The work is difficult in all schools and we recognize that. It's uh, uh, very difficult in the priority schools and um, just to give our teachers a little bit more uh, incentive to stay because it's important to have consistency in terms of the teaching staff and we have on, on years we have turnover there, then that certainly interferes with that consistency. So we want uh, we want effective teachers everywhere, uh, obviously, and we want them in our priority schools, and we want to uh, make sure that we can compensate them in a way uh, that they will stay there, and also to provide the kinds of professional development that will help them to be more effective in terms of the students that they're working with. Thank you. Did you have a I, did, I just had a follow-up comment. Okay. Thank you, Superintendent Thomas and Madam Chair. Um, my only follow-up comment to this uh, item is, as we had discussed at our work session, um, there was quite a bit of overlap between the schools that we would be approving for this extended contract and other funding, including um, some of the magnet dollars. So uh, while I may support this item, I think that, as I stated at the work session, I look forward to seeing the rationale behind um, the magnet programming and how it is directly impacting achievement and um, moving those schools and students forward. Thank you. Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is there a reason that we're approving this now versus during, as during part of the budget cycle? Uh, in, in terms of advertising positions, we've normally uh, given priority schools uh, first opportunity on advertising uh, positions. Um, and what we're going to what we're going to do this year, uh, because of the timing, and we have, we're opening two new middle schools. We're going to post uh, if this is approved this evening. We're we're going to post uh, positions on Friday morning. Dr. Drummond is ready to uh, release that. I know we have teachers at some of the schools where we're moving students, and they're concerned, and rightfully so, about a, a job. And uh, I just want to say too that uh, the teachers that are. Uh, that are doing a good job are going to have a job. Uh, actually, when we look at staffing, um, we talked a little bit about this this morning, the staff is we, we've got, uh, we actually need more positions than we have teachers right now at the middle school level. So uh, teachers that are doing uh, an effective job uh, right now uh, may not be in the same building that they're in this year, but uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that they uh, we relieve those fears that they're not going to have a job. So I know I know how that is, um, and the concern there. We want to, uh, we want to just reassure as much as we possibly can that uh, jobs are going to be there, and we'll get them posted, and and folks can go through the interview process, and and then we'll kind of go from there. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other lights on, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. <clears throat> Motion carries. Item 10G, discussion and action on Leadership Academy Committee proposal, and if approved, a memorandum of understanding will be prepared by the Knox County Law Department and the University of Tennessee General Counsel to accurately reflect the proposal and to be signed by the board chair. 
I want to restate the motion because this isn't really a motion. Oh, you're going to make yeah. Okay. So yeah, because this yes, is a discussion of partial yes, action. So I, I would like to make a motion that says approval, mm -hmm. uh, move to approve the Leadership Academy Committee proposal as presented and then add the rest of the language and if approved, blah, 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 because discussion and possible action is not really a motion. Uh, okay. Do I have a second? Ms. Fugus made a motion. Second. Seconded by Ms. Dethridge. <coughs> we'll open the floor up for discussion. Madam Chair, we have one oh. speaker signed up for public forum on this item. Yes. Candace Bannister. Candace Bannister, Knox County resident. Good evening, Madam Chair and school board members. On Monday evening at the public forum, a speaker felt she was able to confidently speak for the silent majority of those underrepresented voices. I won't pretend to speak for all of the silent majority, but I will say that many people question whether or not it is safe to voice their opinions regarding the Leadership Academy for fear of repercussions or retaliation. There are Leadership Academy administrators in almost every school building across Knox County. I am sure you have found that those lucky enough to attend are certainly 100% supporters and may not like for the Leadership Academy to be questioned. It could be that if the underrepresented voices speak up, they could be given early morning bus duty, afternoon daycare pickup duty for the remainder of the year. Just to be clear, I'm against any continuation of the partnership with the Leadership Academy and with good reason. I have, as I have emailed each of you my concerns, I will not repeat them here tonight in the limited time I have to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will um, have discussion starting with, I'm sorry, with Ms. Roundtree and then Ms. Fuga. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to state before the discussion begins that I will be recusing myself from the vote on this agenda item. Um, as you may recall, I did vote on this when it came up before the board the first time, but since then there has been a change in the hierarchy within the college. Um, some of you may know that Dean Ryder is out on extended medical leave, and so my direct supervisor within the college, Dr. Sherry Bell, is currently acting dean, and so she would be the person that would also be um, negotiating uh, as a member of the college with any agreement that this board brought forth, and that um, because she is my direct supervisor, it has a direct financial tie to my uh, graduate assistantship and stipend through the university. So I wanted to go ahead and state that on the record before the discussion began. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, not really much about this. I think this has been talked about, and I can pretty much count noses and tell you how the vote probably is going to go based on the way we've talked about this for several months. Um, I just want to address a concern that I heard from our speaker, because I've been hearing it for f seven and a half years, that there is fear, no matter what the issue is, anytime a teacher or a staff member um, feels like they can't speak, it doesn't matter who the superintendent is, who the principal is, anything. People are afraid that if they come and speak to the board that there's going to be ramifications. So I, I just really think that that's something that we've got to think about as a system because it doesn't matter what the issue is. It doesn't matter who's sitting in that chair. It doesn't matter what principles in her building, that is something I hear over and over and over, that there is fear to come speak because someone's going to be punished. And I, and I think that's scary and sad. And I think as you talk about culture, that's something that's got to change because apparently it's historically been a problem. It doesn't sound like it's gotten any better, and, and that troubles me. Um, the only thing I will say before we vote is I'm sure we're going to do a roll call vote. And what everybody needs to know is it takes five affirmatives, and so now we only have eight votes. So um, it will take five folks to move this forward. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Owen. I just want to agree with Ms. Fugit. Um, I had a contact from a person in the school district who says that the teachers in her school are afraid to come to the meeting, not even to speak to us, just to come and sit in the meeting. So I, I think that's absolutely something that needs to be addressed. And it didn't start yesterday. It didn't start eight years ago. It has been ongoing for a very, very long time. Okay, 
Was there anything else, Ms. Owen? Your lot was still on. Okay. I see. Ms. Hill. I would just like to kind of summarize some of the things that I've heard. Um, it probably isn't going to change any minds, but um, the one of the first things that was brought to us about the Leadership Academy and the reason that we needed to, to revamp and relook at it was because the contract that we currently had was not legitimate and the law department recommended that we uh, that we um, make that change and and the board did that and and uh, I certainly I did support that move um, Since that time and even before that time uh, I have looked closely at every or everything brought to me as far as the the good and the bad about the Leadership Academy and whether it should continue or, or not continue. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I think most of you know that I retired from the school system. Uh, I was a part of the system when uh, the Leadership Academy began. Uh, I, um, I know many people that, uh, good people that applied and were denied and I I couldn't understand why because their credentialing was was excellent um, I saw uh, I saw the um, the attitude that began because of this and uh, and really seemed to continue for several years and uh, and I understood it I understood it because I I, I saw it happen um, so uh, when I began this process I I was skewed. I was very skewed in it. I started making a list of all of the uh, uh, positives and the negatives, things that kept being brought to us over this academy and whether to continue or not continue it. Um, the contract being the first one, which this board has taken care of. Um, the, the second huge one was the cost involved. Um, I. I was um, alarmed that we were spending almost a million dollars a year for the academy. Um, I, I did feel like that might be money, certainly well spent elsewhere. Um, and we, um, uh, and our superintendent at, at the request of the board came up with an alternate proposal that uh, virtually eliminated the cost to Knox County Schools. So that was certainly a barrier that faced us that, that, that was addressed and it sounds like has been uh, remedied. Um, then this board decided to uh, uh, assign a committee to look at the um, uh, pros and cons of Leadership Academy, if it were to continue, could it continue with, with um, uh, a revamping. Um, I, I commend the work that the, uh, that the committee did. I, I know that um, Ms. Owen and Ms. Horn worked long and hard to uh, look specifically at many, many of these issues. Um, my feeling was that the proposal that was brought to us for the most part addressed many of the concerns that had been brought to us by, uh, by teachers and, uh, and even some administrators and, and, uh, and people that had been very against the academy. Um, there was the concern about transparency. Um, I will be first to admit, and I saw that transparency was horrible. It, it was not good. Uh, in essence, the uh, decision making was pretty well narrowed to one or two people. That was not right. That should not have happened. Uh, but, but that was then and this is now. It did happen. Our committee in its wisdom brought to us a very transparent process that if this were to continue, that it, it, would, be, um, uh, it would be open. <laughs> There would be communication from beginning to end with any candidates that 
uh, that decided to apply um, uh, and that the um, decision making would be not one person or even two people, but it would be upon the recommendation about uh, from Knox County Schools of a committee uh, put together by our superintendent. Um, also the communication that would go every step of the way to all applicants, which I um, totally uh, see as a, um, a step up, as a growth type of um, uh, exercise, if you will, for any of our men and women that are wanting to go into leadership. Um, so the issue about transparency and how it occurred and who picked and all, the committee brought us a solution that, that addressed that. Um, the, um, uh, the issue with the non-disclosure of UT financials to us, of the spending, uh, the difficulty that we had getting the curriculums, um, I didn't like any of that. I, I, I didn't. I didn't think that was that was good for anyone. Um, I still don't know why we've not been able to get uh, that information. But I do know that as the committee addressed this, that um, one of the uh, fixes, so to speak, was for us to have a person, uh, a leadership director, or whoever this person is going to be, which I understand is going to be recommended to us, regardless of whether the academy continues or not, that this person would be front and center in working hand-in-hand uh, -hand with UT and that this transparency, in fact, would occur. You know, none of us can change what's happened, but, but we do have a chance to fix things and move forward. So I, I, I do feel like, even though that was a real blackballing issue in the past, that there is very real potential from this point forward to, uh, to address that concern. Um, The committee also brought us a multiple pathways solution, which is marvelous. One of the real complaints about the Leadership Academy was that if you weren't a part of it, then you would not go into administration. Um, that may be true or, or not true, but the fact of the matter is, it is no longer, if the Academy continues, the way that it is. There have been multiple pathways that have been introduced so that uh, people that do not get into the academy uh, will not feel blackballed, will not feel excluded, and will still have a way to grow and develop uh, and, and become leaders in our school. Um, I heard that um, uh, we were um, spending all this money to train all of these people that, uh, and then we were losing them. Um, the statistics show, thanks to um, uh, recent numbers I got from Ms. Drummond, uh, that we currently have 81 Leadership Academy graduates in our system. Uh, we have lost five. Now, that's a pretty reasonable retention rate, no matter how you look at it. Plus the fact that one of the committee recommendations, which I also thought was outstanding, that anyone that goes into the academy uh, will uh, have to pay a uh, penalty, if you will, if they do not fulfill a contract for uh, X number of years, that they, that they will have a payback in that. So um, even though that retention was not the problem that it was initially presented to be, as I just said, if it is in fact an issue in the future, it has been addressed. Um, I still, even after all that, kind of kind of struggled because I, um, uh, 
we all know the elephant in the room, and that is who's, who uh, is uh, leading the academy and, and the uh, really horrendous time that our school system has had in the last few years because of some of the decisions that were made and part of them relating to the academy. So of these 81 graduates uh, that are still with us, um, I, I had personally talked to 16 of them. So that's um, not quite 20% that I made the effort to go in and, and speak to. Um, many of them I knew personally from years past. Some of them that were brand new to me. Um, and asked them, what, what was good about this? What was bad about this? The biggest negative that I heard from years past was the um, extremely competitive uh, nature that they felt like that they walked into, that they were going to have to, um, uh, it was made very clear that they were competing with the people they were looking at. And, um, and that was kind of a new um, concept. Many times um, uh, that competitiveness, which is uh, very real in the business world, is sometimes not quite so obvious or dealt with in, um, uh, in the school setting. But they, they did find that disturbing. Um, they did share, though, that in spite of that, that the camaraderie that they felt with their um, other cohorts uh, and the fact that everyone was looking toward common goals uh, was a very positive thing, that they were able to um, grow through each other. And that was one of the benefits of being able to come together one day a week. Um, they all uh, indicated they appreciated the ability to have the classroom time. Uh, they appreciated the fact that there were other districts involved um, because we are not an island and we do not need to allow ourselves to become an island just because other theories are presented when you are in a graduate program, other methods of doing things are presented, um, does not mean that it automatically becomes you and who you are and what type of a leader you're going to become. So uh, contrary to some of the negative I heard from the graduates, I did hear that this was a, a, a more of a positive thing. Um, with these 80 leadership uh, folks that we have in the system right now, um, we have certainly ones that are stronger than others. We have that no matter what your educational background might be. It's there. Um, we have uh, probably as many different leadership styles in those 81 people as as we, uh, uh, as exist in any other system. The, the fear, the um, uh, talk about, about the Broad Way, the Broad Academy, which is a big elephant in the room, um, did not appear to infiltrate our system uh, the way that, that uh, that it was presented. And especially now that we have new leadership, we are two years out from this, and I am not seeing that, that this one particular way of doing things has become the end all be all. In fact, if anything, I, from these folks that I talked with, um, they recognized much of the downfall in that particular methodology and chose not to adopt it. Um, you all, we, we, can't, we can't run from this type of thing. We've got to embrace what's out there and learn from it and see what's good, what's bad, you know, what's working, what's not working. And to, to run from that, um, quite frankly, I don't feel like it's growth producing. We need to be open. We need to know what's out there. Knowledge is power. And just because you have the knowledge does not mean that you have to use what's been given. You still have the ability to make your own, own decisions. And I, I do think many of our graduates have done that. 
Um, I have even heard, which troubles me greatly, um, that several of these uh, uh, graduates feel are really almost insulted by the attitude that, uh, that others have shown, the fact that because they went through this academy that, um, that, uh, that they are tainted. Uh, I would challenge every board member sitting here to, um, to look at the uh, Leadership Academy graduates in their district and um, might there be a few that you don't agree with? I would say that number would be the same with those that did not go to the academy. You still are going to have disagreements. But I do know that some of our finest principal leaders are graduates of the academy. I think we may need to be very cautious, whatever the decision is tonight, that, uh, that we don't allow that stigma to be there, which has clearly been out there and indicated by, by several people on this board and also um, in our schools. And probably the last thing that, that I have heard, and I really am trying to address every issue that has been sent to me through emails, um, was that um, uh, it's not fair that 10 people get, you know, scholarship for graduate program and, and everyone else had to go and pay their own way. <clears throat> Just because we cannot put Chinese or Arabic in every high school, just because we cannot have an l and STEM program going on in every high school, does not mean that we should deny the few students that we can give it to because we can't give it to everyone. And I feel like that same thought process is following up with this LA, uh, with the Leadership Academy program. Um, would we all love to have our graduate graduate work paid for? Absolutely, we would. I mean, that that would have. Uh, I, I did my graduate work at UT, and and I'm telling you, it was a tough road to hoe. Um, I, I get that, but to deny the few that we can give this to because we can't do it for everyone, again, I apply it to what we're doing in our schools. We don't <laughs> deny all students a benefit because. We can only give it to a few. Uh, I did hear a couple of very um, touching stories from one current uh, participant and one that graduated about two years ago, and it was not the gentleman that addressed us uh, several months ago about how life-changing this has been for them because they had graduate degrees, they were not not in administration, they had no shot at getting into administrative roles because they had young families, they were heavily in debt. Graduate school was not an option and this has been a path for them. Um, I, just, I just do not uh, um, agree that if this is something we can do even for 10 of our, uh, our folks in our school system, um, that that is a benefit that, um, quite frankly, I just think would be uh, a mistake to take away. Um, uh, and again, this is, you know, this is Terry Hill speaking. So I say all that to say, I think we have been given a chance for a do-over to, to fix everything that was wrong and clearly, whether you agree with the methodology or not, it has not infiltrated our system. And, um, uh, and uh, I would not have any reason to think that that is going to change because, in fact, the men and women that are chosen for this academy do have minds of their own, can decide what works for them, and that's the leadership that they can bring to our system. So I hate to deny any kind of a benefit, even if it's just for a few of our um, uh, employees. So having said that, 
as much as I know and I understand and I hear all of the heartache that has occurred in this system over these last years and some of it being blamed on Leadership Academy, I think the time has come for us to move forward and not just destroy um, a program that in fact is, is um, of benefit to several individuals and to our system as a whole that is in fact a, a partnership that um, I personally think bodes well for Knox County Schools to have this type of affiliation with a flagship university. So that's, uh, that's the reason I will support this, not because of what's happened in the past, but because I feel confident of what can happen in the future if we allow this to continue. Okay, Ms. Dethridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Terry pretty much put it out there because I, my, my thing is the task force worked very hard. I, I sit in on a lot of those sessions and they didn't agree on everything, but they did come together and, and came up with a proposal that we asked them to go uh, research, put together, work with UT, and bring it to us. They may not agree, but once, you, once you're on a committee or a task force, when you finally make a decision, I would say that you support that decision when you present it. I'm, that's just me. That's how, that's how I am. I may lose the battle, but I'm going to support the decision. And I think that if they brought us a, a proposal back and we asked them to do what we asked them to do, and we can live with it, and it is something that has been a benefit, at least I know, to uh, bringing in minorities and more women and putting them in. I know it has been a benefit to my district because we've got one at Houston, Green, Vine, Austin East. They all came through the Leadership Academy. And, I, and they all have talked, I have talked to all of them and they have told me what benefit they have gotten from this experience. And I would hate to think that uh, we're gonna let some, something that is gonna keep us from looking at the future, as Terry has said, something that's gonna move this system and our children forward and what we're trying to do as far as teachers, leadership, administrators, making them stronger and making them, and we should brace the opportunity in order to, for uh, not only for, for um, what can be, but what should be. I think a lot of things that the task force brought back is good things that, that if we adopt these and move forward, it only makes the system better. But I don't believe in cutting off the nose to spite the face. And that's what we're doing if we don't really, really look at the Leadership Academy and what it can do for our system. Not because of what is, is included, Sometimes you have to just look over that, get over it, and move on. I'm, I'm like Miss Hill. Uh, we can't keep dwelling on the past. We got to think about what, what can be, and what should be, and what will be. If we continue, I don't want uh, to cut off a um, um, relationship with UT because that's where most of our teachers and administrators come from. Why would we not want to continue that support with each other, with that collaborative effort with each other? I mean, it, it's just, we have to open up our minds to what can be, what should be. And if we cut it off now, and then next thing you know, the individual that you don't like leaves, then we've already given away this opportunity because of one individual. That one individual does not make or break this program. Whether we like it or not, they do not. This, there's more to this program than that. And we need to just go look beyond that. Um, get over it more so than, and move on. I, I agree with Ms. Hill. There's time when we have to just go ahead and do the right thing for the school system. Uh, the superintendent is willing and ready to work on all the issues, willing to do whatever we need to do to make it better. And like, and if you have a part, we, we got, there's teachers that are not great. So you're not gonna have administrators that are all great. There's gonna be some things that come through that, that we're not gonna be our top choice, it's just life. I mean, that's part of it. Don't throw away the baby with the water because everybody's not gonna be great. That's just part of it. 
So I, I'm, I, I know people say, I knew you was going to support it, but I am because uh, it has been an avenue for a lot of my principals that's doing a great job with my students and my district, and I am going to continue to support that effort. And I want to make sure that uh, this is not the beginning of tearing up some things that has been a beneficial to what we're trying to do in Knox County. Ms. Sullivan, I think yours is the last slide on. I can be fast, I think. Um, I, I want to clarify um, the committee's work was not to make a decision or to make a recommendation. The committee did not come to an agreement that this was the best plan out there. The committee's work was to come up with the best plan we could within the parameters we had to work with. Um, so that's limited before we even started. So I, I want to be sure that everyone understands that this is not a recommendation of the committee. The committee made no recommendation. The committee worked to negotiate the best plan we could make within the parameters that we had. That is not a recommendation. Um, I would also like to point out that we are not destroying a program. The program is there. It's been made very clear to us over and over that they don't need us. When this program was created, it was created um, because the, the superintendent at the time had the money and the desire and the power to create it. He is in a different place now, and he still has the money and the power and the desire to continue the program with or without us. He doesn't need us. Um, something that I brought up to the committee and probably should have brought to the whole board a while back is a concern about, um, it's exactly what Ms. Hill said, that some of our graduates are concerned that um, they are not well thought of. And I would say that's very valid because there are some very rude things that they are called. And if you look at state law and the definition of incompetence, one of the parts of that definition is the inability to command respect from subordinates or to secure cooperation of those with whom the teacher must work. So if we are putting our folks in a situation, choosing just these elite few and putting them in a situation to set them up for that, I think I need to ask myself if I'm setting them up for failure. And I think it's very, I think the concerns both ways are very valid from their perspective and from those who are working with them we need to really consider our place in that. And the very last thing I want to point out are just some numbers. Um, oh, no, I have one little short thing. On October 30th, when this was presented to us, when the findings were presented to us, Clint Sattler clarified the findings and he said that the finding is not that the district would benefit from the Leadership Academy per se but from some kind of principal development. Some kind of principal development, there is a lot that we can do in-house for a lot more people, for a lot less money, without having them go get another degree or put them in a situation where they feel that they have to do something. They don't have to be pressured to feel like they have to apply. Um, between the time that we voted to end that MOU until today, I have not had a single contact from anyone supporting the program, not one. I have had um, 25 contacts <coughs> in writing from people who strongly oppose any kind of um, leadership academy. I did not track those that I spoke with in person or things that I read on social media but they were numerous and they were also all in opposition. If I go all the way back to the weeks prior to our December vote and count those also, um, I've had about 45 written contacts that were strongly opposed to the Leadership Academy and five in favor who contacted me in writing. And also I didn't track those, I spoke with in person, but the opposition was far greater than the support. The numbers are not the only thing that's important here, but because beyond the simple numbers, 
there's another distinction in those groups of people. With the notable exception of Reverend Butler, and I, I wanted to talk to him before I put his name out there, but he is the exception, so I think that's, that will be okay with him. With the notable exception of Reverend Butler, every other person who has contacted me in support of the Leadership Academy also has a pecuniary interest in the Leadership Academy. So we need to decide whether we are voting <coughs> for the financial interests of a few or if we are looking at the interests of the district as a whole. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'd like to call for the question. Uh, I think Ms. Fugit hit it on the head when she said that we pretty well knew how we were going to vote. You know, there are lights on. You know, when my turn comes, I could speak for 15 minutes. It's not going to change anything. I have, a, I have a clarifying question on the vote. That's what that, would be, that would be okay, I guess. Thank you. Okay. My clarifying question is this agreement is for one year. I believe our conversation the other night was that this agreement that we, if, if passed, would be for one year. I just want to make sure that, that that is what we talked about because we talked about there could be opportunity to revisit it. I, that's okay. all I want to know. Am I voting on a one year? Thank you. Uh, Mr. McMillan has called for the vote. What, can I get an answer? Am I voting oh, on one year or, I thought or what am I voting on? Than, I'm sorry, I thought no. you knew that. I, Go ahead, Mr. I was Mr. making Moore. a statement, but I would like some nodding of heads. Uh, you, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fugit. Yes, it's my understanding that from the discussion the other night and, and from the committee discussion that, that if approved, that this would be for one year and that would be what, uh, what our department and the UT General Counsel would put in writing as well. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I'm going to ask Ms. Coatney to take a roll call vote, starting with District 1, and a vote of yes will be to an affirmative to um, continue the Leadership Academy and a vote of no will be to end that. So, Ms. Coatney. Ms. Stafford. I'm going to vote, but I'm going to say this. It's very unfair for Mike to call a question before the other member of the task force had an opportunity to speak, but I'm going to vote, but it's unfair. Yeah, um, now, am I going to vote for this? Yes. Ms. Owen. No. Mr. Norman? No. Ms. Fugit? Yes. Ms. Horn? No. Ms. Hill? Yes. Mr. McMillan? No. Ms. Bounds? No. That's five no votes and three yes votes. Oh, yeah. So the motion fails. Ms. Yeah. Coping? No, Go ahead. Ahead. Item 10H, approve request of Gibbs Middle School to engage in an agreement with the Valor Academy in Nashville, Tennessee to implement the COMPASS model of social and emotional success skills with their students. Okay, I'll, I'll make a motion uh, in favor of this. And, and if there are questions that members have, I believe Ms. Jackson will address those questions. Okay. Second. So Mr. Second. McMillan has made a motion and Mr. Norman has seconded it. All right, there, and then we'll have discussion. Ms. Fugit. Thank you. My, my question, just so I, for, for everyone to understand, I assume this is being brought to us because it is time sensitive and it did not make the agenda, which goes to my bigger question of, we have got to do better about schools getting things in time for the agenda setting meeting. I'm not opposed to this, but I think it, it, it happens from time to time that it, I don't know how it happens, but we just really, I don't want to punish students because an administrator or somebody didn't get it on time, but people have got to do better. Okay. Mr. Dupler. You want me to, I can, yeah. I, yes, I can address that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fugit. I can say that uh, that that the system has has gotten better about uh, uh, deadlines and and uh, issues coming before our office. Uh, I can also say in in this particular instance, it, it is my understanding that it, that this is time sensitive. Oh, I'm sure it is. And that and that uh, that this is time sensitive on the other end, and it was not 
uh, within the control of, of, of the Gibbs Middle School administration. So, well, I also know. understand we had snow, ice, and flu. Yeah. I get yeah, that. Yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah, saying, yeah. in general, that's but why. Our office agrees with your sentiment that, that, that if we can avoid these, okay. these emergencies, we would like to. Thank yes. I, uh, okay, Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, because we did just have this in front of us when we walked into the meeting, I did just a brief, uh, some brief research. And for those of you that don't know, Valor Academy is a charter school that's in Nashville. And so my concern is when I flip through this, the last paragraph, and I don't see Miss White here. She probably couldn't be here this evening um, to address this, so I'll address it to you, Miss Jackson. Um, she says, and I quote, I'm committed to the work of integrating social and emotional learning and competencies into our academic competencies and school culture. I think those things are all well, fine, and good, except for from what I have seen from the Valor Academy, um, I'm not sold that they have the experience and pedagogy to say that they're the experts in this area. Um, so if you would please address that for Absolutely. myself and the board. Sure. Um, so Ms. White and I had a chance to go and observe the work. Um, and to have some conversation and we would be able to establish our own pedagogy. It's the structure and the support and putting the structures in place that we would be um, working with, with Compass in order to get the support there. This is actually something that would be built and designed by the teachers along with Ms. White. Okay. Can I go to Mr. McMillan? Mm -hmm. I'll come back to you, Mr. Oh. McMillan. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I just wanted to say that uh, you're right, uh, Ms. Ms. White is, is out of town. I, I spoke with her, I don't know, a couple of hours or so before the, the meeting uh, began, and she could not be here. Uh, and uh, I believe that it only came to her attention. She wasn't blaming anybody, but it only came to her attention yesterday in filling out the proper form. So. Uh, I agree with what Mr. Dupler said. I think we're doing better, uh, but I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Ms. Fugge said. I've been one of the, the biggest critics of, of not getting things in. And, you know, uh, it, it may come down to the point where we have to, we, you know, like the superintendent, has to at some point invoke some consequences if people continuously uh, refuse to abide with the rules. Otherwise, you know, it, it, it doesn't do any good. The rules are not any good. So, you know, I, I just wanted to, to uh, say that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. And I will say that I have been in conversation with the law department and Mr. Dupler because it puts a real, and Ms. Coatney, it puts a real hardship on our staff, central office staff and everybody else. But I think we have, in good faith, made an attempt and are seeing less, but it, we still have room for improvement. Ms. Roundtree. I'll yield to Ms. Dethridge. She hasn't spoken I'm sorry, Ms. Dethridge. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess my question is, um, this is to, for the teachers that we don't have yet? Oh, I mean, <laughs> and that's been one of the challenges, but they are, when they go to their first training, um, she is hoping to have her, some of her teachers hired, and so they will be able to... Um, in March? Well, they may go to the first training in March, but then um, they don't have to have any product in place until the summer. So as they learn this process, they will be taking teachers, and that's been a very important component to Ms. White, is that the, the teachers are involved in the development of this, because this is not just about taking care of students, social, emotional, but it's also about taking care of teachers, and so it it's, includes them in that process. So when we talk about taking care of teachers, it's not gonna be a part of what we're already doing? as far as positive, uh, emotional, and whatever else is in here. That's what we're, social and emotional training and initiative, is that not what we're trying to implement throughout Knox County it already? It is, and we're partnering with, um, with uh, Missy Massey's office, Rebecca Bittner has been um, working with us, and the state has just released social emotional 
um, standards as well. And so look and that tie right in with PBIS and restorative practices. So this will be an opportunity for them to make that part of the experience of teaching students that personal responsibility, how they learn to solve problems, solve conflict, um, and So we won't have together. PBIS out there. We will. It will be part of their PBIS and their restorative practices process. Okay, and the school funding is coming from internal school funding for from, from Gibbs. the general fund or from the funding that goes to Gibbs Middle School? So I had um, an allocation that went to each middle school, or well, to each of our schools in the district for professional learning, and this is how Ms. White is choosing to use her funds. Um, both, both Gibbs Middle and Hardin Valley Middle's funds are having to sit in my account right now because they don't have school accounts, but they are, they have professional dollars just like the other schools do, and this is this is how she's choosing to use them. Okay, thank you. Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I appreciate the information, Ms. Jackson. I just, I have some concern, and this is just speaks to a broader issue. I emailed Ms. Thompson and Ms. Jackson both that, um, you know, I don't know what the conversation is from the superintendent and our leadership team about um, the discussion and the thought process that goes into um, purchasing pre-made curricula, whatever that may be, because as much as we would all love a silver bullet, there isn't one out there. I mean, there's no peer-reviewed research on iReady and the fact that it works and supports kids. Um, you know, we need to be focusing on programs and pedagogy that are supported by research that shows they actually work instead of whatever the shiny new thing that comes down the pike. I mean, that certainly isn't um, a critique on you, Shannon. I hope you know that. That's just a general conversation, I think, that we need to um, think about as as a board. And, and I will say it did concern me seeing that this was um, really a product of a charter school that has no ed folks in their background. So I appreciate that the teachers are going to have a hand in building whatever this program is. I just hope there's some more um, thoughtful consideration in the future of um, how these limited funds are spent and sort of talking through those decisions. Thank you. Ms. Ellen. Um, I'd just like to point out and be sure that Mr. Dupler sees on page two, the second paragraph. This is also an agreement on behalf of the schools in my organization participating in camp to facilitate the development of data sharing agreement that will enable our organization to share student level performance data with the camp. Um, that, that's concerning. Valor Transcend will use such data in its management and evaluation of the Compass Camp program. So though we're looking at not a huge amount of money and we're only looking at a few people, we are also committing our student data to this charter school. And I think that is concerning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Should I speak to that? Right, Ms. Jackson, did you? Would you like me to speak to that? Sure, go okay. ahead. That is something that we talked about with our REA department and they would be able to um, mask that data so that it cannot be tracked to any particular student. Um, the theory of action here is that if we invest in our teachers and our students emotional um, social emotional that we would see um, increases in student achievement as well. Okay, yes, Mr. Davis, got to address it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Owen. Uh, when I reviewed the contract uh, today, uh, I was I saw that 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 information in there, Ms. Owen, and and you'll note in the next paragraph. It talks about uh, FERPA, which is what I was concerned with, to make sure that that, that privacy was honored and, and that all parties would be complying with FERPA. So, so I do believe what 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 Ms. Jackson is talking about is the case: is that you know, although some data would be shared, privacy and confidentiality would be maintained. I think the concern is still that we are we are sharing our our data with a charter organization that we have said that we don't support, so that's concerning still. Ms. Jackson, could you give me a little bit of the history of how this began? I mean, we're here at this point tonight, and I saw quickly reading through the notes that you provided us that you and two others from our district went down to attend something in November, but 
how did this come on the radar, so to speak, or? So how I became involved when Ms. White asked me if I would go with her, that she has been looking for a way to bring together student achievement and um, the culture of a building. Um, the, that you know, PBIS, restorative practices, social emotional learning needs to be paired with academic learning and that this was something that um, she would like for me to look at with her. Um, and so I went along with um, someone from Missy's department and we talked about what would work in our context and what wouldn't um, and learned that we would have the flexibility to design the program in such a way that would meet with Ms. White's vision for Gibbs Middle and that would really provide coherence to the school around um, these are not initiatives that are at odds with each other, these are initiatives that support each other. So that was exciting to me because you know, there, there's limited time to do development um, and putting your attention on the, the social emotional well-being of our teachers and our students seemed like um, a, something that we really needed to be able to try and to test to see if that was um, making the, the changes that we thought it would. Okay. I had one other question. Um, I noticed down here at the end of the bottom of the page under internal capacity commitments, faculty circles 60 minutes one time a week mm -hmm. with host staff present. Is this in addition, I mean, what is that commitment for staff? I mean, yes. and they already have a lot of meetings after school and faculty meeting. Would this take place during the faculty meeting or separate from the faculty meeting? So that's a place where we've been very clear that it has to align with all um, our Board of Education policies. So we will not be infringing on um, meeting time. We also said that it would be within the confines of the school day. So um, she's looking, she's attached a schedule for the building so that, um, that, so on that the, yeah. it's on the very last, last page, page. Um, where she is, is structuring it. So there will probably be a little flexibility around that full 60 minutes but um, they will have a faculty circle that is about them being able to get together and celebrate the things that are going well in their building and to bring to her the concerns and things that um, they feel like they need to address as a faculty. Okay, thank you. Mr. McMillan. Did you <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know whether this will help or not, but in talking to Ms. White uh, briefly, we talked a little bit about what she was attempting to do and I sort of, uh, uh, from, from what she said, uh, she talked in terms of bringing kids together and no matter what their backgrounds and letting them share their successes and that she believed from what she'd seen and read about these programs that it would be one of those things that would one would feed off the other. There wasn't a negative to it. It wasn't condemning anybody. It was looking at the, the ones that have been successful and trying to raise the level of the ones that, that, that have not as a result of using these as center figures, for lack of a better term. Thank you. Ms. Hill. Is the total cost, uh, is there no charge for the program? That's correct. So it's the, it's the travel. It's the travel. All right. I'm also looking here in step two, though, and is this that um, you're asking for four additional days of teacher contract to be added to the budget? It's the third bullet point I, down, I Ms. see Jackson. the bullet. Um, that's not something that I'm prepared to speak on. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It's a part of this Compass Camp application. Okay. That, that, uh, that the ask is for four additional days. That, that's a little bit concerning. Um. Maybe the super, how would that be handled, Mr. Uh, Thomas? Because first you're asking them to come back in July, four days earlier than the other teachers in the district, and then at under contract time, so added to the budget. What does that look like? Yes, obviously there are cost to, to involved in bringing people in four days. What both schools have asked for is an additional, for one year, an additional four days 
because again, this is the first time the staff is coming together to work with uh, uh, the students. And I, I think, uh, Mr. Spencer, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe in terms of the cost, uh, and, and of course it's a budgetary matter, the budget hasn't been approved yet, but, but I think what, uh, if I'm not incorrect about this, that weren't the four days requested built into those costs that you presented to the board Part of the incremental cost of opening the two new schools for okay. one year only. And okay. that was a request of each principal of each of the two schools. As a, as a follow up, if I may. Go ahead. Um, it also goes on to say we may re also require that eight hours of the district require 12 hours of unscheduled in service be dedicated to compass training. Um, so this would be an additional eight hours that we would be requiring of our teachers to uh, attend? That's not additional hours. Every Everyone is required to earn 12 unscheduled in-service hours, and so eight right. of those hours would be towards the compass training, and then the other four would be used for, for other training. But this, this states that that will be a requirement of those teachers. Yes. That they, this is what they have to do with eight of their 12 hours. That is correct. Is participate in this training. And then it also goes on, and I think this was addressed about, and I apologize, but just seeing this, I'm just, um, uh, on the job, professional learning, the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. So twice a month, teacher plan is going to be totally dedicated to this? I don't think she's planning to do it as their entire plan. I think, and that's one of the reasons why she's doing twice a month, is to break that time up so that they have the majority of their plan period, but they have some of it for their circle. Okay, Ms. Horn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm concerned also about the time. You know, I think, and to, as um, a couple of people have made the point about their, the day already being um, full, so I'm concerned about the ability to sustain those hour-long weekly meetings for an entire staff together. Um, were, have other programs that are similar to this been con been considered, or? Did she just find this one and? This is the one that she brought to me and that, that we looked at together. Um, I think when we witnessed it taking place, the faculty had um, a tremendous amount of unity as a staff. They understood um, the direction their students were headed and the supports that they needed. They understood the supports that each other needed. Um, and they had some great strategies for looking at what was going on in their school and solving the problems in their school together. And so um, that's what made this an exciting process to her. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other lights up. Ms. Hill. Um, I'm, it, so because there's no faculty in place, this is not anything that is, has been uh, uh, run by the faculty. This is, this is a, uh, uh, an independent decision by the administrator to commit all, all this teacher time to this program. I'm assuming if it passes that as she interviews, she will make it very clear that this is the expectation that was of these intent. teachers. That her intent was to make sure that anybody who was applying knew that this was the direction that the school was going and that they would have full awareness of what they were, um, of how, how this was going to operate. Um, she was uncomfortable with that too, that you know, she wanted faculty to be able to be part of that buy-in and part of the process. I think because they get to design it, um, that, that is, that's helpful in that cause and that they um, will have some, some say in that structure around um, what the social emotional competencies are and how they, how they go through that process. The first training is in March. Okay, Ms. Hill, if you're finished, I'll go over to Ms. Dethridge. Ms. Dethridge. One question. So I'm just going to ask this. Now, we have 
been told by uh, Ms. Ms. Massey that there's going to be a lot of training on a lot of things we're implementing in the next couple of years. Um, and this is going to be on top of that, and it's going to be mandatory. I'm trying to figure out how they're going to get all this in. I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about it, and I don't know. Now, I know it's a principal's decision, and they're going to have to work that out. But listening to all the things that we're trying to implement within the next couple of years, it's just seemed like this is just going to be mandatory, and it's going to be every two, twice a week or twice a month or whatever. I'm just trying to figure out how that's going to the board's already talking about so much demanding on the teachers. I'm just trying to figure out, is this going to cause a lot more of um, stress, for a better, lack of a better word, before they even get to the school? I think the way that, um, that Ms. White was seeing this was it brought coherence to the different initiatives. So this is how um, they would get um, job embedded PBIS and restorative practices training, and we'd be working alongside the restorative practice trainers and the PBIS trainers so that it was, um, that this is the training that they'll get. They won't have to go anywhere else to get that training and to be um, implementing that practice and they'll have the time to work together and have the discussions around how it's going and to resolve the problems around that. So this will look different in Gibbs Middle than it will other schools? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Roundtree. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to I guess ask a question about, um, and Shannon and I know you're having to field these since Ms. White is not here, but um, so on the internal capacity commitment, it talks about specifically allocating um, time per week for the school leader implementation. So I'm just wondering how, because you all went to Valor, um, what that looks like and what the scholar circles look like, and then I guess um, oh, what's the best way to put this? So I'm not sure. So how is, um, how is what you all saw there, you know, how can you attribute to that to um, a, a program working versus the fact that this is a charter school that plays by a whole other set of rules? I guess that's the best way for me to put that. Sure. I think, um, to me, what was exciting was seeing the, the scholar circle. We were able to witness a couple of them and to, to watch them um, engage. And they had strategies for, um, they were learning the language of how do you bring up a problem, how do you talk about a problem, how do you go back and forth on that problem. It was advisory, but in a way that was very structured for them to really build their ability to problem solve. Um, they shared work. Um, there were students who, um, brought work that they wanted to share in their circle and talk about what part of that work was a struggle for them and what part of that work was a success and what their next steps um, in, in their learning was. And that was something where what we saw with the students is a real sense of self-efficacy and ownership of their work and a confidence um, with, with their ability to talk about where they wanted to progress in their learning. Okay, thank you. And then just as a... Um I see someone else's line on, so I'll be quick. Just as a quick follow-up to this, so my other concern is um, mandating, and I think Ms. Hill was trying to get at this, but I could be wrong, um, mandating that the eight hours of their 12 hours of in-service is going to go to this when you may have a teacher that is, um, I'll use myself as an example, so if I was in a K, K-5 classroom, um, while I could be certified in that, I really would need some PD and strengthening in math because that is not my my strongest area of, you know, making sure that I'm communicating those skills well. And so I guess I am worried too about it's going to limit um, really staff development to strengthen themselves in the area where they may have a weakness. So I don't know if you can speak to that. Well, since content is my specialty, <laughs> um, I, was, I was curious about that as well. Um, and that's one of the things I talked to the teachers about because um, you know, they, they're spending their PD time doing this. And um, so we, we would have to, we still have the district learning days, we still have content supervisors doing the scheduled in-service time. Um, and then we have the four hours that they would be engaging in the learning. And we have the, coaches and other people who can go and help them in the classrooms. But what resonated with me was the camaraderie within the faculty. They, the teachers there, especially the new ones, did not feel alone or isolated because they had the circle structure. They had people that they could immediately go to and get some support you know, at, at the point of need. 
um, rather than waiting for a PD opportunity to arise at a district level. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Norman, I think we will conclude with you. you. There are no other lights on. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jackson. What's the composition kind of demographics on, on Gibbs Middle School? What's it looking like? Racially, culturally, blah, blah, blah. The school blah. that I visited? I don't know. Gibbs, the, oh, Gibbs. the new school. Oh, okay. The new school. Um, that is, so she put a, um, let's see. I actually, I don't know the exact sp statistics for Gibbs Middle School. Um, okay. I'm sorry. I wish All I right. Let's just, that. let's just assume that it's a middle school and it's a normal middle school. Okay. And I would think that social emotional stuff would be way up there on the list of making this middle school work. And it's a brand new middle school. And this principal thinks it's very important. Good enough for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Norman. Okay, so we have this before us and there's no other discussion. So all in favor of this say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion passes. Item 10I, discussion of cultural competency training. We have a, we have a speaker for that. Oh, I need a, we a need speaker. A motion. We have yes. a speaker. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Norman. So we have one speaker for this item, Demetrius Jagers. Good evening. Uh, my name is Demetrius Jaggers. I'm Nash County, uh, and I'm speaking today as a parent of a first grader and a soon-to-be uh, kindergarten. And I want to just emphasize, uh, I think, the importance of cultural competency training uh, for all Nash County staff, uh, as well as I, I think it's important for our board members also. Uh, there were a few uh, things mentioned on Monday that bothered me as a parent um, and, and the discussion around cultural competency and whether or not uh, it was something that would be implemented uh, correctly. And I think this ties into some other uh, issues too. I think it's important that we uh, do our best. Um, I encourage the board to do its best at uh, prioritizing attendance at the cultural competency and particularly making sure board members are present because uh, as board members, you all make decisions that impact uh, some of those uh, things that happen in our school, and sometimes they could be impacted by implicit bias. Uh, I also want to just raise a, f a few examples. On Monday evening, uh, when Dr. Brittany Anderson and Dr. Lawler, Lauder were both here, uh, Mr. Norman, uh, after they were introduced both as doctors, uh, Miss, you referred to Miss Anderson as Miss Anderson instead of Dr. Anderson and Miss and Dr. Law, Lauder as Dr. Lauder. And uh, based on my own experience, I have I have background in diversity, equity, and inclusion. To me, that is a, a indication of implicit bias. And so I think that it's important that we be proactive in how we address, considering the, the growing number of. Uh, bilingual and uh, immigrant refugee children in our schools as well as the increasing number of black and brown kids and having been a parent of a of a kindergartner who experienced implicit bias in a classroom uh, I was somewhat taken aback by the statement that in 30 years of being a teacher that there hadn't been any incidents I've, I've only been affiliated as a parent of a student for two years and I can talk about more than one incident of implicit bias. And so I think it's really imperative that this board takes that serious um, and that is that is implemented um, as it needs to be. Uh, I also think it's important that we do a good job of partnering with the resources in our community like the University of Tennessee and know that the University of Tennessee is bigger than one individual and that uh, as a former uh, employee of the University of Tennessee, I have my own challenges and issues, but I know that there are great people at the University of Tennessee doing great work and uh, providing great resources to our community. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was some things related to legislative priorities. And I know that 
uh, you know, this is the Board of Education and that education issues are of prime, uh, supreme priority, but I also think that there are other issues on a legislative level, level um, both on the state as well as the local level that impact uh, families Ms. and students. Mr. Jager, yes. this company just brought it to my attention that right now we're discussing cultural competency, okay. so right. if you want to save the remainder of I'll, your time I'll and address it in public forum with our legislative priorities, that would be okay. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Norman. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Jagger, so for uh, for coming and speaking. And indeed, I caught myself uh, right when I said, "Dr. Lauder." I, I really wanted to say, "Mr. Lauder," and say it equally, but I didn't. Maybe I am. So, indeed, um, the thing that I wanted to bring before the the board is um, still a concern that. Um, at least we have some kind of method of evaluating uh, how teachers feel about this, and uh, and certainly my my comments when I say when I said that in my 30 years in the classroom I had never experienced uh, racism that and indeed that was true and and it applied to any faculty member, any staff member. And that was to a suburb in a suburban school and in an inner city school. Not one time did I ever have any, even an inkling, of racism expressed or evident in any way. It's almost understood in the schools that I'm in, you do not do that. It is not acceptable. And that doesn't apply to kids. Kids are still learning who they are. But in the faculty and in the staff, it is not done. It's never acceptable. So anyway, just wanted to just wanted to state that or clarify that. Now the um, the the situation on Monday is a little bit different from what I've heard. At first, it was three schools. Now I think it's four. And as far as I know, it's a seven-hour day in terms of the presentation of this material. And I hope it's good, and I hope it's effective, and I hope the faculty comes out of this, these sessions and they say, we really benefited from this. We really think we need this. This is going to make us better. This is going to make us better teachers. That's what I hope. So. But, but, but I do think it's necessary for us to get some immediate feedback. And so if the, I think there's a normal sort of generic feedback loop that we have. And so to Ms. Massey and uh, to Ms. Jackson, uh, and thanks to, Terry, to Ms. Coatney for uh, accommodating me today. But I hope we've got that and we have some kind of way to get information back to the board so uh, as soon as we can. So I don't know whether I need to make a motion for that or maybe Ms. Massey can speak and let us know. Ms. Massey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Norman, we, as was mentioned on Monday night, we do have a process that was built into the contract <laughs> to, to evaluate the program overall, but based on your request, we're looking at a way to kind of tailor uh, the product that we current, the evaluation form that we currently use that tailors it a little bit more specifically to this training. So okay. we'll have something to provide you with some information. Okay, okay. so at the end of the day, yes. the teachers that go through the program yes. will be able to comment and make, make commentary about yes. what they think about what they just experienced. Yes, sir. That's all I want. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Massey. Mr. McMillan. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's uh, an excellent idea, Mr. Norman, for us to possibly offer some some uh, additional questions and or whatever we're going to do to as much feedback as we can get. You know, we we don't we don't want to detain the people uh, taking uh, you know time at the end of the day that they they, they want to get out of there like everybody else. I understand that. So as long as it's short. But it could prove to be really valuable if, if, if it was structured to where we would see the things that they 
felt were positive and, and if there was anything that they thought otherwise that, that they didn't get as much as they'd hoped for or something, well, that should be identified as well. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, since you mentioned it being seven hours, uh, I think it's important for us to become acquainted with it. I'm sure we're going to be talking to teachers between now and when we evaluate it. It comes back to us on an annual basis. Uh, that's what we agreed to. Uh, but, you know, we can only talk to whoever you are. You can only talk to so many teachers. I would like to see if, if, if there would be a possibility that board members could uh, have a video of it to look at, at from, from time to time. If you wanted to, you know, you might not want to sit and watch seven hours of it, but but you might want to sit and watch maybe an hour or, or 90 minutes of it and try to get some kind of, and maybe at two or three different times, try to get some kind of uh, a feel of, of exactly what, how it was going and the consistency and, and, uh, and whatnot that otherwise we probably wouldn't know except just what somebody told us. Is there, is there any possibility of doing that, Mr. Dupler? Is that your question or Ms. Massey's? Ms. Massey, is that a question you can answer if these are going to be video Ooh. sessions? Uh, Madam Chair, we are not planning to video the sessions. I think there would be two concerns about that. Number one, well, I'll let UT just <clears throat> answer that from their perspective. But this is a topic that is, um, you know, you have to have a high level of trust. People have to feel like that they can have open dialogue if it's really going to be meaningful. I'm not sure that if somebody's concerned about anything that's being said is going to be something somebody can go back and watch over and over again, that, that we're really going to have the atmosphere where teachers can really feel like they can have open discussion. And that's just me being completely honest. So. Well, it's not like we want to put it on the, the evening news, Ms. Massey. I, I, I understand what you're saying. But is there any way that it could be limited, uh, that it could be videoed and limited access to the existing board members just, would, just so what I said could take place? I mean, you know, w we've got a contract with them. We're using taxpayer funds to pay for the, for, for the program. And we're talking about a state taxpayer funded university. So uh, I can understand the copyright aspect of it, but, but by the same token, I think we're, we're entitled to. So I would address that to uh, Mr. Dupler about whether or not I would, most things once we make a recording can be at, requested for a public record. So I, I don't know how that would be, how we would cloak that or. Mr. Dupler. Well, th thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, you know, I, obviously I'd have to, I'd have to dig into the contract and do some research on it. But, um, but, but at, as you stated, Mr. McMillan, I mean, you know, uh, it's my understanding that UT has, uh, you, you know, uh, what, whether they call it copyrights or, 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 or you know, whatever uh, artistic, you, you know, uh, properties they have. I mean, you know, this is this is their intellectual property. So, um, you know, I'm sure that we would need to to uh, tiptoe around that. I mean, oh yeah, I'm sure know, it would need know. to be secure and not be made available to probably to the public. But anyway, thank you. Okay. Did you want to address anything else, Ms. Massey? Do you want to hear? From, did you want to hear from UT? That's now? fine. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, effectiveness of this type of program is in the interactions between people, not in a video recording of those interactions. Um, the way for the board to experience this would be to come to the session, spend the day with us. It's deep. It's difficult work. It can't be done by watching a 90-minute video. If it could, this would be a lot easier. The RFP specifically forbid any bit of online training, and that was wise because this work does not happen online or through videos. In addition, as we, were, as we are doing this work, it would have an amazingly chilling effect 
if the teachers participating knew the board could be watching them participate in this activity? So I have a question then, because I would love to come sit in on the seven hour training, but I already committed to babysitting for two working moms on Monday and won't be able to. Um, but if, and I'm not challenging that, I agree with what you said, it just, there's a little bit of disparity there between inviting board members to come and participate and then watching. I mean, do you feel like that it would be chilling also for a board member to sit in on that? Because I know that is something that has been expressed in Knox County a lot as I came on the board and tried to sit in on meetings. So what is your feeling on that? Quite possibly, yes. Okay. So, Do you the want us to come or not? what? Does he want us to come or not? He just no. asked us to. No. I, was well, he, I was answering the question: Would it have a chilling effect? Yes, it would. If you want, we could possibly add to the contract a training just for the board. We can come. We can do this just for you. That's not part of the original contract. We could can iron we? out how that would work. Okay. I guess that's something for us to consider, Mr. McMillan, and then I need to get to Ms. <clears throat> Allen and Ms. Coates. I was just going to respond to what he said. He just got through asking us, inviting us, and telling us we should sit through the seven hours and participate. But then he says that it's going to have a chilling effect. So, I, I, I mean, which is it? I'm not, I'm not sure what you want. I do not think it would be effective to have board members there. If you want us to do a training just for you, if you want to sit through the training, we could do that. I think it would be very valuable. We can break it up. We don't have to do, it's one three hour session and two hour and a half sessions. We could break those up, do them over time. Well, you know, obviously most of us don't have seven hours to, well. to, to sit through the thing. Okay, I think he's answered the question, Mr. Okay. Owen. So if I can go to Ms. Owen and then Ms. Coons and then Ms. Dethridge. I think a lot of the questions that we're asking should have been asked a really long time ago. Um, should have been asked before the RFP was complete. Um, and also when, when we discussed the second RFP long ago, one of the discussions was that we would like to have the board trained. We talked about doing that before it went to the staff. And I think if that had happened, we would not be having any of this conversation right now. Um, I would also say that the question of whether it would have a chilling effect on the staff depends a lot on our relationship with the staff. There are schools in my district where it would not be a good idea at all. There are schools in my district where it would be perfectly fine, I think. Um, and I, I'd say that that's the case for all of us, that there are some places where we feel very welcomed and where they feel that we welcome them. Um, so I, I think whether we are there or not, we need to have that conversation with the principal um, and the trainers to determine that if, if that's something that we need to do. Um, I, I think there is, I think there's some misunderstanding in language. And if some of this had come to us as training sooner, we wouldn't be confusing overt and implicit bias. And I think that's really what's happening right now. I don't think we are having an argument about implicit bias. I think we are having an argument about overt bias and confusing it with implicit bias. And that is because we needed some questions answered sooner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kent. I would like to um, give this to Ms. Etheridge before I speak. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand. I mean, I, I've been through something similar to this when I was working for another company, and it is something that is really personal 
sometimes the conversation get very personal, and it's something that I, I believe the teachers would like to know that they can have candid conversations without the board being in, in, the, in the room. I mean, I, having been through that, I know that is just, that's just the way it is. And I do, us, I do remember us talking about having this before, but we never made a decision. We never, we never decided to do it. We had discussed it, but we never said we were going to have it prior to this, this agreement with UT. So that was on the board. So they went on and did what they, they were supposed to do and what we asked them to do. But if we want to, I think that that's in the individuals that want to go through this on the board, that's fine. I've been through it. I don't care to go through it again. I understand. Uh, the feeling of it is not comfortable, which, you know, which we heard from uh, Ms. Fugit the other day. It's not a comfortable conversation. And I think the teachers need to have their time to be able to go through this without the board being involved, being, and let them do what they need to do. We hired them to do the job. And if we want to, like uh, Tony said, get some feedback on how effective it is, I agree with that. But I don't think we need to be in the, in the room. I think we let them, need to let them do their job and report back to us how effective it is. That's just Ms. my Kays. opinion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to express my support of cultural competency because not only does it affect the teachers, um, it affects students directly. This is about how to build relationships with students. This is about training teachers to be able to effectively handle and develop um, relationships with people who have struggles every day that I see every day. Going to an international baccalaureate school, I come in contact with people from all over this world and with all different experiences of life and walks of life. and. Thankfully, my program has prepared me to be able to appreciate those differences and to be able to recognize my own biases whenever evaluating um, different cultures. Um, I believe that that is something that has prepared me very well um, and that I, is invaluable to everybody. Um, and I think that this is an opportunity to, for you um, to be able to make a decision that allows every single um, um, teacher an employee to have the opportunity to be able to um, develop those skills and become more self-aware. So here are three reasons I believe that it is a necessity to be able to allow this training to occur, not only for um, teachers, but for the future of this district. This will impact students. They will learn from the teachers. They will then learn how to do this for themselves. So. Number one, I experience um, and see people be discriminated against and have bias against people every day. We all do. Whether we are aware of it or not, everybody you come in contact with has a bias of their own, a perspective of them, their own, which needs to be recognized. It needs to be recognized that we each have our own personalized backgrounds and we have to interact with other people who have their own personalized backgrounds and um, this training would allow that. And so self-awareness um, of these issues is essential to fixing the issues. The problem has a, arisen multiple times over the course of my sitting on this board that the culture that is in the school um, system is flawed and there's distrust and there is um, issues in communication and this would allow maybe just one step to addressing those issues effectively. Um, and I believe that in doing this it leads me to my second point that this is going to be a trickle down effect for students. Whenever teachers are trained on how to be self-aware of their biases, these um, skills and this awareness will then be shown to students. I can tell you right now that my teachers and their behaviors and how they address problems, you can tell whether a person is aware of their own biases or not. And I can assure you that teachers who are aware of their own biases develop stronger relationships with students and better relationships and are able to further their education and their well-being. Um, even more. And so this allows um, the chance to address biases early in students. <laughs> it, it, sometimes in adults it's too, too late almost to be able to address these biases um, because they're so ingrained in who we are. 
Um, but with students, if we're able to maybe make an impact on a couple of teachers throughout the district, that will then shape the future and allow those students to realize early what their biases are and not allow them to continue the cycle of discrimination, not allow them to continue to be, be satisfied with not progressing the world socially or not progressing their own self-awareness. So this training would allow that to provide a good example of leadership, which then leads into my third point. No matter how much time or effort this re training requires, positive social change is worth it. If I had to sit through seven hours of a video that would show me how to develop deeper and stronger relationships with everyone I encountered, it would not be a question whether or not I could carve out time in my day. It would not be a question whether or not I would partner with people who are willing and begging us to do that. Um, and so I believe that we really need, or you all really need to keep in mind the future. It is not about the mistakes that have been made in the past. There's many mistakes. That's what makes us human. But it's about what we can do in the future to prevent those from being so detrimental. And it's about what we can do in the future to help others not make those same mistakes. And so by allowing this training to occur, you are setting an example of leadership for students to then become leaders themselves. This isn't about um, how our own experiences now or in the past have affected us. This is about allowing the opportunity for people to not have the negative experiences or not or be able to cope with them better in the future and so I believe that it's absolutely essential for the progression of the school district to allow this to be a, a positive use of like eliciting soliciting self-awareness of teachers and then therefore it will impact the students and that's what we're here for we're here to make a change in this world. We're here to make a change in students' lives and developing personal relationships by eliminating these biases and educating our teachers. Um, that's how you do it. That's how you make change. And so I'd like to thank you all for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kurtz. Do I hear a motion to, oh, we've got, we still have, yes, we, we do. We still have public forum. Thank you, sure. Ms. Roundtree. Okay, so we have um, two folks left to finish up their time. So when you come up, I'm going to call your name and tell you how much time is left, and we're going to make sure the clock is set right for you. So Candace Bannister, and you have three and a half minutes left. Again, good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, Candace Bannister, Knox County resident. Usually on Valentine's Day, I'm rushing home from school to start making banana pudding with my son, Will, for my husband, Mark. It's his favorite dessert. This evening, I will share you, with you Will's thoughts from February 10th, 2017. We found this in Will's room after his death, and I think it's important for you all to hear his words. My feelings, February 10th, 2017. Today has been a really good day. I woke up this morning around 8 or 8.30 because the girls are coming to clean the house. Most mornings I wake up and feel sad I'm not asleep anymore. But this morning I woke up feeling rested and good. I went downstairs, had Pop-Tarts, and watched a movie. I felt entertained and happy rather than the normal feeling of laziness all day. I had McDonald's for lunch with my brother and then I took a nap. When I woke up, my family was home and I talked to them. At this point, I was already having a good day because everything has gone well and I haven't had any bad thoughts. Most times I wake up and feel gloomy because every morning I wake up is a reminder of my greatest failure. I never wake up early to go to school because I'm kicked out. I always have to face this every day when I wake up, and it has been building up for a while now. However, recently my mom has been home in the daytime, and she has kept me happy. Also, everyone else is out of school, so I don't feel like an outcast today, or really since school has been called off since Monday afternoon for the flu. All of this aside, the biggest and best part of my day had not happened yet. This occurred when I woke up from my nap and walked the dog with my mom and dad. As we were walking, my dad told me that my attorney had called and that I could go back to school. Mr. Witt was working with the deputy law director who knew my case was being treated unfairly. The deputy law director talked to the superintendent, then Buzz Thomas, and got me less days than I had been given. This is the best news I had heard in a long time. I'm so excited that I get to go back to, be fa to Farragut and be in a normal school. 
I like the alternative school, but it puts a label on me that I'm a bad person and that I'm one of the losers who isn't even good enough to go to a regular school. Now, none of that matters. I'm going back to Farragut and I'm going to be like everyone else I know. Hearing this was the best news I could have heard. Things only got better as then I got to go see a movie with my brother and Brandon. It was a pretty good movie. All of this is until now when it's about 11 o'clock and I'm writing this. Overall, today was a great day and maybe things are beginning to look up. I feel happy now, like I matter. As you can imagine, I was broken by my son's words. Night school is a problem. While my son woke up every morning to face his greatest failure alone, I was in my classroom at West Hill School meeting the needs of my students. My older son was home some days with Will, but my husband and I were at work. Did you hear the part about my mom was home with me and she kept me happy? Who thinks that night school is an acceptable option? We only saw Will in the 30 minutes it took to take him to night school and after we picked him up at 7.30 at night. Where was the care for my son? Where was there even access to a guidance counselor? Why weren't, wasn't there a guidance counselor in the disciplinary meeting for a long-term suspension? Why did administration overreach in length of the suspension? Why didn't administration ever address the seller of the supplement my son possessed? Why wasn't a director from the deputy law director followed by Farragut High School? Why did the appeals officer uphold that suspension? Why did it take the law director to clean up their mistakes? Consider these questions as a board member, but please consider them as a parent. I think you would have questions too. Will's words, I feel happy now, like I matter. Thank you. Our next speaker is Demetrius Jagers, and you have a minute and a half left of your time. Thank you. So my, uh, my last point of uh, emphasis was just related to legislative priorities. Um, and looking at the legislative priorities that have been proposed, uh, to me it's a little concerning to, to see nothing related to the way that uh, immigration policy uh, both on the state and local level with the 287G is currently impacting uh, families and students uh, in Knox County Schools. There are families who are preparing at this moment, uh, making concessions in the, in the event that they are deported. Um, and there are teachers, uh, ELL teachers, ESL teachers, who are actually taking upon themselves to become um, uh, power of attorney for some of these kids um, and uh, there are teachers who don't feel like they have the support needed in order to cope with their students losing family members or being fearful about being arrested uh, and so I think this should be a point of emphasis as it relates to legislative policy for Knox County School Board. Thank you. Madam Chair that concludes public forum move adjourn. Okay second. Mr. Norman seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned.